Okay, hi everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, Geneva, and thanks uh, to Erna. I'm from South Africa, as, as you know, which is not Southern Africa. It's a country called South Africa. <laughs> the only country on the continent that has the name Africa in it. And of course, it's right at the bottom tip. So this one I'm going to speak about, New Africa, New Journalism. And in particular, I'm going to speak about the, the cultural issues around well, what is Africa and what is journalism in Africa? And how does it get reported? And there are three things I'll talk about, which is the image of, of, of Africa. And uh, I'm sure people here wouldn't say to me, oh, you once met a person from Cairo, would I know this? <laughs> I sometimes meet Americans who say that. Uh, Cairo, as you know, is right at the top of the continent, and you know, Cape Town is at the bottom. And uh, where I am is about uh, a thousand kilometers east of, east of Cape Town. So I'll speak about the stereotypes and I'll speak about going beyond some of these things. I, I think this might have some resonance because when you speak of Africa, you're also speaking of race. And race, of course, is a huge issue around the world. So, okay, Africa. Let me ask you quickly, what image of Africa, what else does Africa, what does it conjure up in your mind when people say Africa? Any? Huh? What? Hunger, thank you. What else? Music. Music. Okay, what else? War. War, thank you. What else? Wildlife. Hey? Wildlife. Wildlife. Opportunity. Opportunity, okay. Anything else? Aids. I, I can't AIDS. AIDS. AIDS, okay. So let's talk about some of these issues. For a lot of people, Africa is like this because it's a place where there's still lots of wild animals. And as we'll speak about, there's, it's one of the few places in the world where animals still, still eat other animals. It doesn't happen in many other continents <laughs> on the scale that it can happen in Africa. You know, what about the people, okay? So I think when you say you're African, usually it connotes that you're black African, okay? So some of us are white Africans also because we were born there. But generally speaking, it means that you're marginal. Often you'll see maps of the world, and they say that the world, in, you know, world economy in 10 years' time or right now, and they, basically Africa doesn't even feature. It also means that it's a malignant place, and I'll speak about that. You know, it's kind of not really a, a place that you want to have much to do with, especially with HIV AIDS. And uh, at best, it's an object of pity. Okay. You feel sorry for people who live there. You might get a bit of reflected fame, <laughs> as you may know. <laughs> Madonna adopted the little Malawian boy. Who, He's actually a very sweet little boy. He's now about four or five years old and they've just visited Malawi. But that's the kind of reflected exposure that you get if you live in Africa. So there's a writer called Barney who, uh, already in 1999, said that when people think of Africa, you tend to think of these things. Primeval, instability, corruption, incompetent leadership. And there's certainly, certainly enough uh, foundations to give rise to that kind of thing. Now some of you may have heard of Keith Richburg. Geneva, do you know Keith? Oh, yeah. Okay. Keith, Keith used to be at the Washington Post, and he reported on Africa. And this is what he said. I'm an American, but I'm a black American. Descendants of slaves brought from, from Africa. If things had been different, I might have been one of them. Or I might have met some anonymous fate in one of the countless ongoing civil wars or tribal clashes on this brutal continent. This is what he said about his time reporting around parts of Africa. 
He says, I thank God my ancestors survived that voyage to slavery. And when people say, don't you have some affinity with uh, your ancestors? He says, no, because I rub your nose in the images of rotting flesh of Rwanda. He says, I'm sorry I've been there. And he says, uh, I've had an AK-47 round up my nose. I've speak, spoken to, talked to machete building, to two militiamen. None of the victims across the t-shirts. I've seen cholera epidemic, famine, civil war. He says, I've seen cities reduced to rubble because of their leaders let them decay while they spirited away billions of dollars to overseas bank accounts. He says, thank God my ancestor got out. Well, I think it's a bit of a euphemism saying they got out. I mean, they were taken out, okay? <laughs> or sent out, a combination of say, push and pull. But uh, it wasn't that they got out. Anyway, he says, thank God. So that was his experience of, of Africa. And of course, that affects the way he, he reports. And he did report in Africa. And it is, as I said, a kind of pretty wild place in some ways. You know, animals eat animals, and you know, some people are pretty rough towards other people. Um, so, those are the kind of images, I think, that go along with, with being in Africa, and people like Keith Richburg have that perspective. So, the ca classic complaints if you live there is that the coverage presents Africa as if it's uniformly wild. Often I get asked if there are lions in my, <laughs> in my backyard. <laughs> okay, that's pretty savage. It's a black hole, um, dark continent, tribalistic, AIDS infected, conflict ridden, child soldiers, and short of food. Okay, some of the things we said, these are the connotations that tend to go around in, in Africa. And the question is, to what extent is the media to blame for creating that sort of impression about a place? Now, if you look at the poverty statistics, these are statistics about the number of poor people between 1990 and 2004 on World Bank. And you can see, in East Asia on the left, the number of poor people has actually declined. In Sub-Saharan Africa on the right hand side, it's actually gone up over that period. Okay. And then if you look at this thing here, this, uh, the same water again over the same period, 1990 to 2004, you can actually see the darker, darker box. Okay. People, more people have, have, have uh, no access to safe drinking water now than they had previously. So these are really in, uh, damning statistics on sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at the uh, media development, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which you know, by 2015 the United Nations adopted them, and this is the global uh, uh, targets that have been set. They say that they think they'll reach this global target, but in sub-Saharan Africa, they don't think they will. Okay. Poverty remain, uh, rates remain about, about 40%. So the resulting reports, this is The Economist, as you know, and they did a cover a few years ago, and they said the hopeless continent. you really got to write it off. The point of me going through this, I think the Afro-negativism that you get isn't, doesn't fall from the sky. It's not a pure kind of invention of hostile people. Uh, you know, Keith Richburg's attitudes were shaped by his actual experiences. So it's not without foundation. But on the other hand, I think it's only half the story. Okay? And I'll tell you why I think it's half the story. Because there are assumptions about black Africa that really color things. And people come with a certain amount of cultural background when they report you on Africa, including Africans. Okay? So that you think you're reporting what's in front of you, but actually you've got a spotlight of many centuries of thinking about Africa that's shining behind, from behind you and is highlighting certain things and casting them in a certain light. And it's about stereotypes. And stereotypes, Western stereotypes, but a lot of Africans also subscribe to these stereotypes. And that's why I think it's half the story to only stress the negative part of it, because they're also positive stereotypes, but they're both stereotypes. And I'm going to critique that also. And the biggest thing is the generalizations that you get in reporting Africa. Now, there's another American journalist uh, uh, who I'll speak about now, but he really signals this point, that when you speak about Africa, you're implying that this whole huge continent is an homogenous place. And it, it's kind of, it's not entirely a, it's a myth, but it has some historical foundations because it was all colonized, all subject to a lot of racism, slavery, a lot of it, marginalization on the global stage. But at the same time, all the struggles for independence and so on, struggles against marginalization, that led to a pan-African sentiment and a lot of aspirations. So if you speak to a French journalist, a journalist in Paris, you say, what are you? That's our, just we Francais. You they won't say, I'm a European. If you speak to a Kenyan journalist, the chances are to say, well, I'm Kenyan and African, because African 
consciousness, very close to national consciousness in, in Africa because of this history. But anyway, the point that I'm really trying to make is the reality is also extremely diverse. And when people speak about Africa, they, you know, they usually mean sub-Saharan Africa, but of course we even know, you know, at the most basic level, the Maghreb region at the north is very different. It's Arabic Africa. Anyway, this is the other journalist who worked for the New York Times called Howard French. Do you know him, Geneva? <laughs> okay. He covered a lot of West Africa. And he said this statement. He wrote a book. And he said, Africa eludes us. It's so clearly outlined on the map. But it's so difficult to define. It's too large and too complex to be grasped. In fact, rarely have we tried. That's a very profound statement, I think, that he said. Except that, and he's wrong, it doesn't elude us. We fill the gap by coming with cultural baggage. He said, an often thoughtless broad brush treatment lies in the fact that diversity in a country of 53 countries, and even this is not a settled number of countries, <laughs> and close to a billion inhabitants, it's a place of light and dark, rich and poor, increasingly well-governed and still appallingly ill-governed. So it's a real kind of mix of things. You know. Anybody know why he says 53 is not settled as a number? Any Africanists here? Well, it could be, uh, there's some discussion about whether you include the islands or not, whether you include Somaliland, uh, how you count the number okay. of states. It, you're absolutely right. Um, it, you know, Ar Africa was colonized in the countries of base and colonial borders, but there was a country, in particular a country that was Spanish, colonized by the Spanish, which Morocco claims, but which wants to call itself a separate country. So some people say there's 54 and some people say there's 53, depending on whether you take the Moroccan possession as a separate country or not. And then the uh, Somali land is actually recognized now by, the, um, by, by much of the world as a separate country. So against that background, I'm going to tell you now about something that's interesting, because this is going to be a very big event. And I want to call it football, but you might get uh, confused. It's soccer, OK? <laughs> now, you may know your national team almost won the, the warm-up to the World Cup. The World Cup, uh, since 2004, uh, when Nelson Mandela was trundled out to win the World Cup bid for South Africa, was um, South Africa's the host. Now this, it's organized by a big mafia called FIFA, who are about the most, uh, <laughs> most untransparent and most corrupt organization you could imagine. But there are more members of FIFA than there are of the United Nations, because every country has one vote in FIFA. And so the FIFA barons get every tiny island to be a member, and then they, they buy them up. And yeah. that's how they... Anyway, uh, I won't get into too much detail there. But the point is, this is a huge event. People say it has a bigger television audience than the Olympics. And although you people think football is, is big, <laughs> soccer is bigger on a global scale. And as I said, your team nearly won in the giant dress rehearsal. So watch your team. Anyway, so this is a very interesting thing. Uh, it's led to a huge amount of expenditure in South Africa. In fact, we were spending our way out of the recession long before the recession hit us <laughs> because we were building infrastructure for this World Cup. We've got to build this huge world-class stadium. This is a stadium which looks a bit like a, a big gem squash kind of thing because it's a very African thing. That's, that's the biggest stadium. It's called Soccer City. It's in Johannesburg. It costs you millions and millions to build all these stadiums. But you can see it's a pretty classy kind of interesting thing. This is Cape Town. You might know of Cape Town. And you can see the beautiful positioning of their stadium. Um, so uh, there's a lot of investment that's going into this thing. And it's going to be a moment when the world is kind of looking at, well, what's happening in South Africa. Okay? So this creates a unique opportunity to think about, well, what is the imagery going to happen? What's, what will happen? Because, I mean, these, are, these images of the stadium are not images of, of wild animals killing each other or people starving or, or of wars. <laughs> So, uh, okay, let me just go back here. Now, part of this, uh, let me see if I can, okay, so part of this is South Africans are doing a lot of stuff to try and um, promote. Is the audio going to work? In South Africa, we have different ways of playing football. It's rhythmic, playful, and never boring. We call it in this a unique township, South African township playing football, football. In this league, every move has a name. Names like Samaya, Hill Extension Card, and Chef, to name a few. We put all this book together to create a dance that's uniquely South African. So, Swalala, I just want to show you what I'm talking about. Hola. So, now watch me. One, this. One, two, three, four, and four. Thank you. 
<laughs> okay, so as you can see, there's a lot of energy going into trying to reconstruct the image of Africa through these kinds of, of things. They create this dance and they're trying to export it. And in fact, if you look on YouTube, you'll see that they were doing it in LA and some people were learning how to do this in some public event. Anyway, you can see from this, these clippings here also that there's a chance to change negative perceptions, uh, projecting a positive image of South Africa. So it is, act, it is a real opportunity to do this, especially because you've got this huge global television audience. But it's a question about whether it will succeed. Okay? Will it really re revalidate South Africa? Now, we come to a very interesting point about is it just South Africa or is it wider than that? The UN uh, Secretary General said this. Uh, quite recently, he said, it's a great part of the intimate story of Africa. <coughs> okay? He didn't speak about South Africa, he spoke about Africa. Now, as the SABC, that's the public broadcast in South Africa, as they phrase it, South Africa is the stage and Africa is the theatre, which is an interesting metaphor. But it does show you that, in a sense, although Africa is very different, and South Africa is certainly very different to other African countries, you've got this global image that the two are interconnected, okay? And that what happens in Africa spins off the image of South Africa, and what happens in South Africa spins off. The, that is the reality of it, okay? So that's where this thing comes in. So it becomes important because there's a lot more at stake than just South Africa in this World Cup. So over here, you can see this is um, another clipping. It says, Africa is a continent with a, rich, with a rich reservoir of resources, but the continent's biggest asset by far is the warmth, friendliness, humility, and humanity of its people. And that's the official slogan, Kinako, which means uh, now is the time, celebrate uh, Africa's humanity. So you can see uh, this is beginning to be constructed way beyond South Africa. So what you've got is that South Africa then is a stand-in for Africa. Okay? So if this thing is successful, the whole of Africa could benefit in terms of the way people understand it. But there are also kind of negative uh, connotations about Africa. So, Although this is being organized in South Africa, there's a stereotype of African time, okay? <laughs> there's also the idea that there's one African perspective, an African perspective, which many people say, if you live there, we've probably got more perspective in South Africa than you've got in many, many other places. Afro-pessimism. So I'm just talking about this interdependence between South Africa and Africa and the way it gets represented in the media. Again, you can see now it's not just building the South African brand, it's building Africa's brand. Okay. Our former president, he said this, speaking on behalf of the continent as he was wont to do, he said, we want on behalf of our continent to stage an event that will send ripples of confidence from the Cape to Cairo, create social and economic opportunities. And he went on to say, we want to ensure that one day historians will reflect on this World Cup as a moment when Africa stood tall and resolutely turned the tide of the centuries of poverty and conflict. We want to show that Africa's time has come. So a lot of rhetoric in this uh, expansion of what the story is. Well, interestingly, this I just picked up the other day. This is a Brazilian journalist that you see him over there, Geraldo Castro, and he is doing this. He's coming out to, to, to Africa. In fact, he's leaving now. And he's traveling around eight months, 18 countries in Africa, and this is what he says. He's going to do a lot of stories. His key objective is to uncover the many faces of hope that shine in this part of Africa. We will not focus on the negative side. He says he wants to work on the public opinion in Brazil by doing this. So you can see a lot of people are buying into this thing. Let's rather, let's compensate. You know, there's been so much negative stuff about Africa. Let's really kind of redo this whole, re-engineer this whole thing. But there's another concern, okay? As much as this is an opportunity to project all the positive things about Africa, you could also have the opposite effect. If somebody gets mugged or somebody gets raped or somebody has a bad experience, it could actually just reinforce what many people really think about Africa. So uh, I, I could go into this later. This is a very, very interesting story about you know, the re reporting of crime. And we sh for sure we have a crime problem in these South Africa, particularly in some areas. Okay. A German security expert, he recently said that this country's team should come and play wearing bulletproof vests. Okay. This is uh, the British newspaper, The Sun, is saying, don't engage in casual sex because you could get AIDS. Okay. <laughs> So this whole attention on, on South Africa, and by extension Africa, could actually be important in a negative way. Now that's the one kind of side of things, but the other side is the positive sort of stereotypes. And Sepp Blatter, who is the gangster who runs FIFA, <laughs> uh, 
he he is on record as saying this. Oh. After this, I'm like, <laughs> boring, boring journey. In Africa, you not only have rhythm, but you also have music, dance, and importantly, the ability to dream. Okay. So what you've got in this is this concept of Africa, which now this concept goes back, you know, 600 years. Africa is populated by noble savages. Okay. On the one hand, they're noble. They've got an innate sense of rhythm. You know, they haven't become um, modernized like you know we've lost our sense of rhythm. You know, they still they still have it. They're still back in the Garden of Eden in a sense. Okay. And then the other side of it is that there's a savage side. So you get a noble side and a savage side. And the savage side is is really dangerous in Africa. Okay. So you've got two stereotypes here. And some people say, well, we've had so much of the one, we now need to have the other one. Now the interface of blackness then is that you've got these, this very strange kind of combination. And sometimes people combine them, sometimes people stress the one or the other. But you've got these two assumptions, cultural baggage that goes on about Africa, and particularly about blackness. Ubuntuism is humanity, sense of humanity. So it's a very essentialist view. It says that there's an essence of being African, which any of you who have studied sociology, you'd know there's no such thing as a human cultural essence. Anyway. But these are the, this is the, the savage essence, and this is the, the noble essence. Esau Pahari was our former minister in the, in the presidency. He said this is going to be an African experience. This is the Kenyan Peter Muti. He said Africans are like this. So again, you've got a kind of something that doesn't gel well with good journalism. You've got essentially stereotypes of work here. So, now the question is, against all that kind of baggage and this opportunity of the World Cup, can there be a different journalism? Can one prove what is basically a racist interpretation? Either positive racism or negative racism. But can you do, can you, can, you, can you get beyond that? They expect there'll be 18,000 journalists visiting South Africa during this thing. So, if we say that this idea that there's a singular Africanism, which is a meaningful thing you can actually work with, that you can expect Africans to be either dangerous or, or fun-loving, rhythmic people, if you can get beyond that, if you say that's invalid, could you say that they'll actually have an experience that will, where the complexity will actually say, you know, let's get away from the stereotypes? That is the big question. Or will people come there and do parachute journalism? <coughs> Telling the stories, you know, news is often very old. <coughs> Certainly, in terms of African stories, you, have, you very seldom get new things coming out. It's the same, same stuff. So will the journalists, these 18,000 who are coming, including the ones who are there, be able to tell the story in a much more nuanced way? They say what's new and what's specific without generalizing. Will they cover what's interesting, what's ugly, and what's uplifting? The whole gamut of things, including the combinations. This is a very famous editor in my country called Matata Tselu. And he says, basically, he's addressing African journalists. So African journalists are just as subject to this cultural baggage as many Western journalists, and Eastern journalists, for that matter. He says, you've got to reflect the good and the bad, not just the good and not just the bad. So this is a very interesting project, and I'm, I'm about to end up here, um, set up to try and tell photographic stories about Africa and football. And there's some really interesting uh, and fresh stories coming out of this, uh, if you <coughs> produce by Africa Media Online. That's the kind of stuff which I think gets beyond stereotypes, gets becomes much more interesting. Those are some of their pictures that they've got. So to end up here, I've kind of covered the difference. That we all have this image of what does Africa mean? And the, the, I've hopefully said, you know, it's really difficult, dangerous to generalize. Now I've said there are all these hopes to rebrand them, but it's double-edged because if you depend on a stereotype, one stereotype to counter another stereotype, you're actually still not getting to the actual complexity of the story. And that this is the question, whether new journalism from Africa and about Africa will acknowledge and move beyond this background baggage that we've got. So, 2010, I think it's time to stop whinging about Africa getting a raw deal in terms of global coverage, <laughs> or Africa getting PR, because you actually want journalism, you want journalism that's going to be a winning journalism. So really, that's the challenge for those of us who are working in this field. Um, and uh, that's all I have to say to you. That little ball at the, end, at the thing there is uh, from a, a women's community project. It's beautiful beadwork. You can't necessarily see it that clearly, but uh, anyway. That's, it's giving rise to a lot of interesting um, talent and creativity within South Africa, at least. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Okay, well, we, we've been running a conference of African journalists for about 14 years. In fact, it'll be the 14th year next year. And it's, it started, it's called Highway Africa, and it started in relation to the internet coming to Africa. And we thought, wow, you know, the media needs to understand this. So we have this very big conference, which has grown to be the biggest gathering of African journalists in the world, centered around how do journalists use convergence and understand convergence and m-commerce and e-commerce and m-health and e-governance and all that stuff. So we are having this during the World Cup. And we've been, the past two years, building up towards this, trying to train African journalists to say, listen, we've got to use this opportunity to tell stories in all their complexity. You can't do a PR job and you also can't do a hatchet job. You've got to be a journalist. You've got to kind of get rid of this, these kind of assumptions. So we'll bring these people out during the, the World Cup. We'll have our conference and they'll also report around it. And at the same time, we are having the World Journalism Education Congress. And I really hope Geneva is going to come and be a, a major speaker there. But our idea with this World Journalism Education Congress is that all the journalism teachers from, from around the world can come and we can say, listen, now you're here, you can see this place a lot, is a lot more complex than the stereotypes. And some of us are working on a project to, de to develop a suggested curriculum. If any J schools around the world want to run a course in reporting Africa, here are some resources that can give you the complexity and the nuances of the thing. So we want to give people that when they, when they come up there. So we've got those two initiatives for the World Cup. So we, and we, we're doing a lot of stuff with our students as well. Training students, preparing students to do a lot of blogging, reporting, running, and, and covering all the stories. There are so many stories around this World Cup, from business stories through to science stories, doping stories, global stories, <coughs> image stories, gender stories, um, women trafficking stories, Africa uh, supplying kids to Europe for football and the trafficking <laughs> that goes on there. There's a lot of really interesting stories. Stadiums, infrastructure, employment. One of the things they're doing is there are 3 million tickets to these games. They're giving 80,000 tickets to the construction workers. Isn't that a nice thing? There's a woman who's, she's the only woman who drives a, a, a crane, you know, a building crane. You know, she got a, she learned how to become a crane driver in South Africa during this thing. There are those sorts of stories as well. So we've been working with our students to find these stories and tell these stories. Very cool. Um, I, just one more question. How many of you are going to be going to South Africa this summer? I know some of you in the room. Yeah, cool. As you all know, Professor Ernest Smith runs that program, and so it's going to be an exciting time to be there. Okay, I'll shut up. Questions? Somebody back there had one. Yes? Could you give us a sense of the challenges that, that people in your program or the journalists in general in South Africa have telling their own stories about, about the country, and then, and then also maybe challenges journalists in other African Well, I think sometimes it's similar to journalism here in the sense that newsrooms are being cut down and you know, people have to do telephone journalism and it's the usual suspects. <laughs> it's kind of where do you get the resources in time to go and do like, you know, actual on the ground reportage. And then people are wrestling with convergence and how do you tell the story on lots of different platforms and how do you make money out of that to sustain the journalism. So it's not that different in some ways to the kind of issues that you're facing. I think uh, maybe some of the complexities are that lots of languages spoken, so if you don't speak a lot of languages, your access and understanding of things isn't the greatest. And that cuts across, you know, it's not just a white-black thing, in many, in many African languages as well, uh, but they're often regional, so it depends where, you, where you're based, if you can understand. You might understand one African language in one region, but not in another region. Uh, let me think what else. Uh, the society, I think, you know, we're still a young democracy. People are not, uh, I think, completely familiar with a free press. So the wider population isn't always sensitive to the importance of journalism. And so there's a lot of media literacy that's still needed. So as a journalist, you don't necessarily gonna, you're not going to find a tolerant population with some of your journalism, especially if it offends some populist. <coughs> And then I think from around the continent, South Africa has media freedom. A lot of other countries do not. And that's, that's their biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. you know, how do they actually try and be journalists rather than govern publicity people or find themselves being arrested? That's, that's a big challenge. Too. But I'm happy to talk to you more detail later if you want to say. Okay.
actually on that point, Corolla Bio, yeah, the school uh, associate in for strategic initiatives. I also teach a course in African public diplomacy. Okay. And it's been uh, a challenge because mostly what we find is South African public diplomacy. There's very little on any other country. And with the World Cup now, in particular, push um, to change the image, as you say, of South Africa, specifically in Africa and more generally. What do you think is happening in the relationship between South Africa and other countries in terms of media relations? I mean, are, can you see any particular responsibility in pushing those countries that you just mentioned that lack media freedom or that lack <coughs> of resources that South Africa has to put into media infrastructure? Is there any effort at all to organize around that in some way so that there is a, a multiplier effect beyond just the World Cup? For the profession, yeah. essentially. There is quite a lot of, of tra training of journalists going on around this. And it's, it's more than just sports journalism. It's more than just commentary or describing the, the game without using cliches, which is quite difficult to do. <laughs> uh, and so there are stories about, so let's have a look at the bigger questions of tourism and infrastructure and accountability and money and who's, who's making money here and how much money is being, being you know, going to FIFA's coffers and how much is going to the elite and how much is going to the masses. So I think there's quite a lot of good journalism that is being promoted. One story, for example, that I heard one of these training courses is food. Because we have all these international teams, they come to a place and they're familiar with food and they want to eat their own food. And so they might come from West Africa and they, they really like West African food, which you do, you do not get in South Africa. So what happens around the food? And are there business opportunities for, for people to to service those food needs and so on. Mm. So it, I think that there's some sense of how do you make this thing more of a legacy project? But the questions, you've got these beautiful huge stadiums, what will you use them for afterwards? <laughs> I mean, I, maybe you'll host the Olympics in you know, the next 20 years, but even then, I mean, what do you, how do you really justify that investment? And you know, there's been a lot of jobs to build this whole, whole thing, but what happens there? We've got, um, some nice uh, broadband pipes put in around the country, but you know, do people, well, the ordinary people have access to them afterwards. Those are, those are the, the, I think the media are wrestling with it. Could do a better job about that. There's some interesting coverage. Um, FIFA, you know, have got, um, that's why I said they're mafia. They have a company called uh, Match, which they contract to do all their organizing. They book out a huge amount of accommodation and transport. And Seth Blatter's nephew is actually one of the four shareholders in this company. So it's interesting, I had a debate with, with some students, not our students at another campus, and they were saying, because of all the negative publicity around Africa, all the stories now should be booster risk. You know, nobody should cover anything bad. So I said, what about the story about Seth Blatter's nephew? And I thought, well, at least this shows that corruption is not an exclusively African thing. This is Swiss corruption. <laughs> And they said, no, no, that shouldn't be reported now. It should be held till after the, after the game. So it's a pretty backward attitude there. I think I'm a part of some journalism students, unfortunately. Were they South African or? Yes, South African else? ones. Yes. <laughs> but and so what, just in terms of broader Africa, South Africa is very keen to say this is a pan-African thing. Other Africans are not so sure about this. They say, you piggyback here on our name. And really, what benefit is there going to be for us? But at the same time, there is a pan-African aspiration where people say, first time in African soil, you know, the World Cup. So you know, there is a sense people want this thing to succeed. So that's a mix. So over there. Could you talk about um, the language rep languages represented in the media and how much of a market share or, I mean, how many readers or viewers um, are for each uh, language that's represented in South Africa? Well, in South Africa, there are um, 11 official languages. Uh, there's a few unofficial ones also. Uh, they, they're kind of often regionally based, but your, your print media is primarily in, in three languages. English, Afrikaans, which is the language of the Dutch settlers, which the mixed race population speaks by and large. And then there's Isi Zulu in the east of the country. But print media doesn't have much other language conference. So it's three out of, out of 
11. But broadcasting is much more, there, there are lots of uh, mother tongue language broadcasting, r radio stations in particular. Television, still, still getting there. Is it mostly Anglophone? Like, mostly English? Yes, yes. The, the language of politics and the language of business is all English. So in the media it's also? In the, in the media, yes. It, it, like in a press conference, it's always in English. Okay. So, but, but what I'm saying is that in, in radio, there's a lot of mother tongue broadcasting. So quite often journalists who can speak uh, indigenous languages, they'll interview a politician and they'll say, give it to me in English and give it to me in Zulu and give it to me in Swana. So the politician, if they're fluent, they'll, give it, they'll say the same thing in three different languages and they'll go out in three different stations. Wow. Sorry, Nani, you were... Well, I'm just getting interested in this idea of um, the potential transformation from a particular viewpoint of reporting to hopefully you're opening something slightly broader and bigger and, and less um, and less uh, colored by um, this history that you're describing. And I'm just curious to say how you might be, how is, are you prepared to kind of track <coughs> that shift and those changes um, as a university, a journalism university? I mean, you know, I, I mean, I know certainly in Los Angeles after the Olympics, there was a massive change in the city. And so I don't know how well that was, how that was tracked or not, but I'm just curious whether you have any thing in place that you're gonna use as sort of yardsticks or do you, is there something like that you can do? Well, that raises a lot of interesting questions because you may know that there's a sport called rugby, <laughs> which is also a big thing outside of the US. And South Africa won the Rugby World Cup in 1996, which was two years after democracy. And Nelson Mandela surprised everybody by wearing a, a rugby jersey. Of, uh, the rugby was very much a white sport by and large up to that point. And he wore this jersey and he went on the field and everybody just thought, wow, this is the biggest nation building thing they could ever have. And it was a real gesture of reconciliation and we all all the same and so on and so forth. So since then, since 1996, uh, Desmond Tutu had this notion of the rainbow nation and we're all blurring into each other. We're all South Africans first and black and white and uh, mixed race and Indian and Zulu, Kosa and everything else. We, those are secondary identities. But since then, these other identities have played up a bit more, um, partially for reasons of political mobilization. So the big question is, will this, will this cup lead to more kind of sense of feel good, we're all kind of South Africans, and the world is looking at us, and will it also lead to, we feel we are African, because last year in South Africa there was terrible xenophobia by mainly black South Africans against some black Africans, uh, powered by competition over jobs and things like that, but it, it was really violent. About 80 people were killed in this, in this violence that erupted. So you know, that sort of really, I think, gave a different dimension to South Africa being part of Africa. But you know, again, so what will happen if you have African teams playing, because the South African team is completely useless. The South African team is in this game, but will be knocked out in this first game, I'm quite sure. <laughs> but, you know, some of the other teams are pretty good. Okay, the Ghanaians and the uh, people from Ivory Coast are pretty good. So will the South Africans now cheer those other African teams, or will they just be agnostic? <laughs> so uh, these are some of the issues that we've got to look at, the kind of nation-building issues um, that have come up. Are we going to research them? We haven't completely finalized the research agenda, but we're working on some things. The one other issue that we will definitely be looking at is they have these public viewing areas because the tickets are quite expensive. So they have these fan parks. And some are, are FIFA fan parks, and you, know, you can only eat McDonald's there, and you can't wear any branding that's not from a FIFA sponsor and it's all so but there are also other fan parks which are unofficial and uh, they have a big screen and people go there they did this in Germany and they're very very interesting phenomena because you have collective viewing and dancing and cheering and blowing trumpets and things so we'll also research what is what's going on there how do people understand this this kind of experience of viewing these images of what's going on so we will do some research there but we still got to get our research agenda appropriate together. And so, yeah. Uh, I'm curious, this idea of uh, pan-Africanism, it, does, does it, it doesn't extend to the North, does it? I mean, like, a, like an African in uh, South Africa wouldn't, wouldn't have solidarity with like, someone in Egypt, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, because the, the, the constant, you know, Africa, what is Africa? It's a name given to a landmass. Right. You know? It's nothing else, really, but it does refer to certain kinds of histories. That every country in, in Africa, except for Ethiopia, was colonized. So even those countries, the Arab countries, were colonized. Or something. So there's a certain 
social kind of commonality and the history of independence uh, from the 50s and 60s onwards did lead to this kind of vision or aspiration that we are Africa and we need to have self-determination for different countries. Um, and, we, and we'll respect these artificial colonial boundaries because that's what we've been saddled with and for purposes of peace and so on. So, so uh, that's uh, certainly at one level you do get this and it's a real sentiment. But uh, at the moment you drill down a little bit, it, it begins to unravel because things are so different. You know, I mean, yeah, the North is Muslim, the South is not Muslim. The North has got Arabic culture, and a lot of the North looks more to the Mediterranean. And a lot of the, the South kind of looks more towards you know, the U.S., perhaps, rather than anything else. So it's, it's, it's a very, very big place and very different. And yet you've got this, this strange thing that people <coughs> believe in Pan-Africanism, which really was a, an aspiration. It was a political project that was built, I think, coming out of the 1960s and led to the formation of the Organization of African Unity which represent all the states, including the Arab states. So it's there. It's got a certain kind of pull and a certain reality. But once you start drilling down, it, it, it doesn't tell you that much. But you can't ignore it completely. So this is the complexity that one's got to convey as a journalist, which is quite difficult. So you were going to say something. Yes. Yeah. Um, welcome back to the Annenberg School. Thank you. I think the last time you were here was good. About 10 years ago. 10 years ago. And, uh, the question I had is, if I had a, to add another word at the beginning, it would have been vulnerable because the resources in Africa are so amazing, the natural resources. And uh, in the Financial Times, almost every day you see an African country or a company cutting a deal with China. Um, and, and I think that the, um, the impression we have now from reading these stories is that, that there are uh, other developing countries that are moving into Africa to uh, claim its resources. Sure. And, and there seems to be a willingness on the part of Africans, in some cases, to give those resources up at a, at a great cost. Um, is, is that, a, um, uh, is that the true of, of Africa in general, or uh, and is South Africa escaping some of that because of its sophistication of its, of its economy? Well, I, I, South Africa itself, one of the, the biggest banks, has sold a lot of shares to a, a, the, the Central Bank of China. And so South Africa is part of this staging posts to, you know, doing business in other parts of Africa. But the Chinese interested in oil, which is what we've got in cobalt and stuff like that. So the Chinese are doing a lot of deals. And uh, it's a very interesting thing because they're also involved in media. So they are working a lot with government-owned media because a lot of media in China is state-owned, as you would know. So they work with their counterparts in Africa for training, for technology supply, and so on. And so some of the coverage is, you know, kind of just you know, doesn't go into the issues at all. And then you also have, by saying that Africa has been a victim of kind of racial assumptions, Africa also ha people in Africa have racial assumptions about China <laughs> <laughs> and about the West. So you know, it, it's a very kind of mixed and convoluted thing. But on the whole, I think that um, for, for, some, for some people in Africa, it's a good thing to actually have China interested because you, you're actually in demand. You know, instead of being marginalized, there's actually somebody interested in investing. And there's, this, there's some strong arguments that are made that Africa, part of Africa's problems are a function of Western aid. The Western aid is well-intentioned on the whole, although sometimes it's just a way of giving business for Western companies. But to the extent it's well-intentioned, it's let governments off the hook. So instead of governments actually doing what they're supposed to do, you know, <coughs> financing education and health and so on, governments have continued the inept and corrupt ways in many cases, and foreign aid has enabled them to keep doing that. Because the Chinese, have, they, they, don't, they don't play around with aid in the same way. <laughs> they are far more business-like. So some African people say, we'd far rather deal with the Chinese because we know where we stand. There's no hypocrisy about it. But China also sees itself as a developing country to some extent, although uh, it's a lot more developed than much of Africa. And of course, the whole of Southeast Asia, I mean, Africa and Southeast Asia used to be on similar levels of economic development in the 50s. And you have to ask yourself, what, what, what explains the difference that Southeast Asia developed and Africa didn't, uh, by and large, apart from South Africa, which is a, a different kind of fish. Although there's a lot of poverty still in South Africa. 
ask you to focus for a minute on the new journalism part of your right. uh, speech. And that you all <coughs> are doing a lot of innovation, and you're doing it in a continent which is more advanced, really, in terms of the use of cellular technology and news. So talk to us about some things we could learn from your own experience in experimenting in journalism. OK. So in our country, we have a population of about 50 million, 50 million people. And about 10% of those people have got internet access. And that depends what kind of access you're talking about and what statistics. But anyway, it's probable that more than half of those people have access don't have access on their desktop computers because they don't have desktop computers. They have access on their cell phones. And some of them are using it for, for just like downloading ringtones and they don't actually realize there's a whole internet out there that they could be using. But, you know, it's, it's changing, I think. And phones are being upgraded, and uh, there's 3G and stuff like that. And people who can afford those kind of packages are getting it. So the media, I think, belatedly is getting into playing in this mobile space. And I say belatedly partially because the sheer lack of desktop connectivity means that they're not facing the same crisis as the US media. Newspapers are still growing in most of Africa. The same old business model is perfectly viable <coughs> and will be for quite some time. Though. But what, they, what they're not uh, really looking out for is mobile coming up fast. Who else is getting into the journalism business on mobiles? And how do you actually converge in that direction? Um, there's a few things that, that are being done here and there. But uh, our own university, we own the city newspaper, uh, which is, when I say city newspaper, it's a small town newspaper. <laughs> It comes out twice a week, and our students go and work there, and it, but it also has its full-time editorial staff. And so we've been trying to play around a lot with cell phones and citizen journalism, because this is a big thing that you, you know, a lot of people have got mobile phones. Most of them are very poor, but people are poor, and they just use prepaid, and, uh, and they receive calls rather than make calls. But people can do text messaging. And so we're trying to say, well, to what extent can we get citizen journalism on a text message basis? So at our newspaper, we've been training um, youth in, the, in, a, the local, in our local town. We've now started classes for adults. We've got a citizen journalism newsroom, uh, partially because people don't have a lot of access where they are. They don't have a lot of skills, journalistic skills, and also citizenship. What does it mean to be a citizen? Don't take it for granted, you know. It's their rights and their responsibilities that people don't always know about if you're a young democracy. I dare say, even in the U.S., not everybody knows what it means to be. <laughs> what does it really mean to be a citizen, as opposed to just an amateur journalist? A citizen journalist, what does that mean? So we've been trying to pioneer quite a lot of this stuff, and with the Knight Foundation, we got a, a good grant, mm -hmm. and so we've started a project which is a whole open source technology content management system, uh, which will which enables us to send and receive text messages, build a mobile site, and. We're still in the kind of early phases of this, but it's beginning to introduce quite a lot of stories into the newspaper that weren't there before. Are you using Drupal? Yes, yeah. we use Drupal. Yeah. There's a story about uh, and, and, and we're also trying to experiment with business models on that because you know, you're going you to be caught you know, five years later and you've, you've missed the boat of the business model. What's it called again so they could look at it? If you could find this on YouTube. It, uh, uh, in the English, it's called The News Is Coming. So if you just Google that phrase, the news is coming. It's got a local name, which is Ian Daba Ziafika, which means the news is coming. I believe you're chairman of the board of your local daily newspaper. Yes. That's a very appealing notion. <laughs> well, we, the university owns it, so right, there, there's some difficulties there because the paper has editorial independence, which the university doesn't always like. Oh, sure. <laughs> I get caught in the middle. I was going to ask, how, how is the project being received by the citizens? citizens? Grahamstown and elsewhere. Is, it, is there a sense that uh, somehow news is being watered down, or they you get the same level of respect and legitimacy for the citizen journalist contribution as you're doing for the professional journalist, or is there? Some kind uh, yeah, of it's, it's not the citizen contributions at this stage are not at the level where they're taken as. Kind of serious journalism. Mm -hmm. They're more like tip-offs or they're little opinions, you know, like letters to the editor, but in many form. And we've had some like photographs of you know, houses burning and stuff like that, which I suppose you could say is more reportage. But the actual story behind it is not necessarily being told. Mm -hmm. 
So we're still trying to develop the journalism up to the level of journalism. But people are very keen to do it because we've got a society that for 300 years, most people didn't have a voice. They've had a voice since 1994, the majority of people. But uh, not in the media. So suddenly, you know, people can participate in media, and that's very popular. Uh, popular to the extent that in, in some African countries where this is taking place, governments are threatening their media, saying, we are going to ban the, the dissemination of, of text messages in the, in the, via the mass media. Because the mass media journalists tend to be a bit more circumspect, I think, about the degree of criticism they are, they'll have of their governments. But the public just let rip. <coughs> and so in Namibia, um, that kind of citizen expression is really, it's, it's in trouble. In Namibia? In Namibia, really? yes, yes, oh. absolutely. Yeah, I was just there a month ago, and uh, the government was seriously browbeating the editors, saying you've got to stop publishing. And the editors actually are publishing, they're not publishing the most violent. I mean, the hate speech stuff they actually don't, and the racist stuff they don't put in. But it's the other stuff, which is still unacceptable to governments that are not accustomed to that level of public expression. Yeah. Interesting. One final question or comment from anyone? Sorry, if I can go there. Would you say, talk us, uh, tell us a bit about um, your program and the emphasis of your program and the transformation of it from basically a sort of elite separatist place to this more diverse, inclusive place that it is now. Yeah, school. okay, so I, I studied at the school. I went there in 1975. <laughs> and I think there were basically, in a group of about 200 students, there were maybe three students of color in the whole school. And they had to get special dispensations to come in. And a lot of students of color didn't want to actually humiliate themselves in getting those permits anyway. But now, of course, it's, it's changed because you know, there's no, no longer racist uh, restrictions uh, as there used to be. And, uh, but they're class issues now because it costs money to go to university. So who, who can afford? So it's, a, it's been a struggle. You've got to get scholarships for people to try and provide greater access. And then you've got to also try and work on your curriculum because the curriculum that served people in their first languages was fine in the old days. Now ma the majority of students don't have English as their first language. And how do you validate their knowledge and their forms of expression in those languages? And what we've done now recently, we've just agreed that every student taking journalism has to take a co-requisite one-year subject in the local indigenous language. Uh, which won't, doesn't take them that far, but at least gives them some sense about, um, you know, I suppose, greeting people, you know, just breaking the ice and, and working with, with the people who, whose mother tongue is not in English. And we often cannot speak that good English. And that goes for some black students, uh, some actually do understand the local names, but not all. So it's also white students. So um, there's that. So one of the, the good things about the change over time is that we used to have to spend a lot of time in the old apartheid days doing press law. Because there's so much law and censorship, you have to know how to walk through this minefield. And of course, now you don't have to do that. Okay? So we then could get rid of those classes and introduce classes in new media and conversion stuff. Uh, we do quite a lot of trying to merge courses. So we have courses in, in public journalism. Uh, so people deal with the theory, but then they do pro projects as well. So we call them journalism, democracy, and development. Because in that part of the world, you can't really deal with democracy. You also have to deal, deal with development issues. So we've done stuff, stuff around. What, is it, what does fatherhood mean? And, you know, from a development point of view and a democracy point of view. You know, in the social fabric of, of, our, of our small town. And we do stuff on environmental projects and so on. We, we have quite an applied component to our course. But we also have, because it's a university, you also have to have quite a lot of intellectual stuff and research stuff as well. So we pack a lot of stuff in, uh, which is so difficult for students to do justice to both. But I think we can pull it out. Was there anything else you wanted to mention? Tell them about the building. Oh. Yeah, in the pictures of the building. Uh, okay, yeah. The Africa media matrix. Yeah. So we, we've got a, a journalism school, which um, uh, you've got a very nice one, but I think our one is nicer. <laughs> <laughs> our one is very funky. We, 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 we designed it to be a, a place that should inspire you about media when you go into it and engage media issues. So 
I don't think we've got a white wall in the place. <laughs> They're all different colors, multicolored wall. And every wall has got some kind of installation on it, which is not quite a, like a museum. It's more of kind of an art gallery, but it's also African and ethnographic and media related. And we've also got, um, if you go into the, the bathrooms, you've got quotations on all the tiles of uh, journalism. <laughs> And there's one from Geneva on there. Isn't there's one from Geneva. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's 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 a it's a space that students really enjoy coming into because it's not like going to class. It's not like a typical university building. It's more like a, a play center, I suppose. You know, it stimulates you all the time. You you can't not even when you go to the restroom. Kind of, you've got to confront media issues. <laughs> and we call it the Africa Media Matrix because we want it to be the, the, the mecca of media education around the continent, which I think we, we are to a large extent. We do a lot of work with journalism teachers from around different parts of Africa. Not that we've got all the answers, we learn a lot from them, but we kind of are the center of energy in terms of aggregating people into meetings and setting up online discussions and developing criteria for excellence in African conditions. The one thing that faces uh, journalism schools a lot in Africa is that you can't just have a good internal curriculum. You've got to also play in the public space. You have to be a public intellectual involved in press freedom issues, policy issues, research issues, community outreach, mid-career training, because nobody else is doing that. And if you want to be re relevant, you can't only work with entry-level students. You've got to be equally uh, externally focused. So we've been pushing that as a, as a model. Excellent lessons all. We need to work on enlivening our, our media matrix. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much.